Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on a film that introduces a famous actor, has huge Star Trek all-series connections, and the title had an asterisk for an explanation. Today's movie is the decent film noir, Rumble on the Docks, 1956. This movie has three overlapping battles, the Diggers Gang versus the Stompers Gang, the Corrupt Union Gangsters versus the Dock Workers, and a father versus his son. IMDB.com has this movie rated at a fairly low 5.6. On RottenTomatoes.com, the movie has neither a tomato meter score nor an audience score. At the time of release, Variety said, quote, The theme of juvenile delinquency is set down in a promising background in this gutsy Sam Katzman production, which combined brawling juvie street gangs with longshoremen labor troubles on the Manhattan waterfront. The film packs considerable violence, but gets in good characterizations and is an okay entry for action houses, unquote. I say it's worth watching to see a young James Darren in action, and many of the violent scenes are ahead of their time. Actors. Timothy Carey played local hood Frank Mangus. Carey, who's always good at playing a creepy guy, was first covered in the exceptional heist film noir, The Killing, 1956. I have a full video episode of The Killing, 1956, and the link will be in the description if you want to watch it. Robert Blake played Chuck, a Digger gang member who was second only to Jimmy. Blake was first covered while playing a Mexican child in the stellar John Huston directed film, The Treasure of the Sierra Madres, 1948. I have an audio version of this one and the link will be in the description. Blake's career went from our gang to starring film roles and he eventually had his own series, Beretta from 1975 to 1978. He was charged with murdering his wife, but was later acquitted. James Darren played gang leader and working class hood Jimmy Smagleski. Darren was born in the city of brotherly love in 1936. As a teen, he attended acting classes with coach Stella Adler. Today's film, Rumble on the Docks, 1956, was Darren's first acting credit. Following this film noir, Darren was in two more with the Tijuana Story, 1957, and the Brothers Rico, 1957. Tall, dark, and handsome, Darren was tagged for the formulaic love story of the Gidget films. These surfer girl films include Gidget 1959, Gidget Goes Hawaii 1961, and Gidget Goes to Rome 1963. Darren was in the role of Moon Doggy. Darren went on to have a few hit songs in the mid 1960s. This sparks an old theory that I will talk about in the conclusion. Darren was one of the time traveling stars in a television series that profoundly affected my life. Darren was Dr. Tony Newman in the Time Tunnel 1966 to 67. He was on another hit TV series that came after my prime viewing years, T.J. Hooker, 1982 to 1986. If the previous wasn't enough, one of his films is the beloved war movie, The Guns of Navarone, 1961. Darren is still alive and his last credit was in 2017. Celia Lovsky played Jimmy's mother, Anne Smigleski. This fascinating actress was born in Vienna, Austria-Hungarian Empire in 1897. Her father was a Czech composer and Lovsky was trained at the Vienna Royal Academy of Arts and Music. She was doing well as a stage actress in Vienna and Berlin by 1929. This is when she met the young actor, Peter Lorre. Lorre was Jewish and those damn Nazis started acting up. The couple fled to Paris and then to London. They married while Lorre was working on The Man Who Knew Too Much, 1934. Lovsky had a small uncredited bit in the film as well. The married couple moved to Hollywood. Lovsky did not act until the marriage ended in 1945. She was prolific as a character actor between 1947 and 1974, appearing in over 240 films. A large number of these films were film noirs. Lovsky's films included Chicago Deadline 1949, The Killer That Stalked New York 1950, The People Against O'Hare 1951, The Big Heat 1953, as an uncredited picture of the gangster's mother, the Blue Gardenia, 1953, as May the Flower Woman. New York Confidential, 1955. Today's movie, Rumble on the Docks, 1956. Death of a Scoundrel, 1956. While the City Sleeps, 1956. The Garment Jungle, 1957, as Robert Loge's mother. Hitler, 1962. And the sci-fi standard, Soylent Green, 1973. Lovsky died in 1979 at 82. I have audio-only reviews of The Big Heat 1953, The Blue Gardenia 1953, and The Garment Jungle 1957. Links will be in the description below. Freddie Bell and his Bell Boys 
mostly played the Las Vegas Strip and may have introduced a young Elvis to the song Hound Dog. There were in a few movies, including Rock Around the Clock 1956 and Get Yourself a College Girl 1964. More about this in the conclusion. Hey, don't forget the merch. Get a shirt like this or a cup. It really helps the show. Story. Della, Laura Carroll, and her little brother Poochie, Barry Froner, casually walk on an industrial pier. The pier is located in what appears to be Brooklyn and is a pretty rough area. Della has recently moved back to help her mother out. Not too discreetly, two members of the Stomper Gang, Tony, Dan Terranova, and Gil Dan, Robert C. Ross, are following Della. The Stompers are in Digger's territory. Before the two Stompers confront Della, she tells her brother that gangs like the Diggers are just criminals in the making. As the two Stompers attack Della, Pucci runs and lets Jimmy Smigleski, James Darren, know what is happening. Jimmy is the head of the Diggers gang. He sends gang members to see if any other Stompers are around. Jimmy and Chuck, Robert Blake, head to save Della. Jimmy, I got Della. Stompers. Where? The docks. It's Tony Light and Gil Danko. You two guys cut through the alley, see if any more Stompers are around. Come on, Chuck. The hoods have drug her into a warehouse and are sexually assaulting her. Well, stompers! You wouldn't act this way if we was diggers, huh? Help me! Hey, well, you know she's really mad. Hey, Tony, why don't you two kiss and make up, huh? No. Oh. Jimmy and Chuck beat the two stompers and save Della. Tony says there will be a rumble about this. Poochie asks Jimmy to walk Della home. As they walk, Della tells her ideas about gangs and fighting. She talks about how Poochie wants to be like Jimmy. She is all in for peace. Della tells Jimmy what he did was a fine and noble thing. Della invites 10 diggers to the settlement dance. Della says Jimmy can be her date and she will provide tickets for the others. Later that day, gangster Joe Brindo, Michael Granger, and his goon, Frank Mangus, Timothy Carey, stop by Jimmy's dad's printing shop. The father, Pete Smegleski, Edgar Barrier, is a dedicated union organizer, prints an anti-Brindo newspaper, and has a broken back because of a dock accident. Pete blames the accident on Brendo trying to stop his union organizing. This time, Brendo is trying to buy Pete off by giving him printing contracts. Jimmy enters the shop as Mangus tells his father it means $3,000 yearly. Pete is not interested. Brendo then threatens to file a libel suit to break Pete. Brendo says hi to Jimmy as they leave. Jimmy's mother, Ann Spiglinski, Celia Lovsky, comes down the stairs just as Pete hits Jimmy across the back with a cane for insisting that Pete take the Brendo deal and calms the situation. Pete is very upset about the path his son is on. Ann says Pete is mad at Jimmy because his birth caused him to take the dock job. That night, Freddie Bell and his bellboys belt out early rock and roll at the dance. Everyone is wearing nice clothes and having a good time. One of the dance chaperones, Dan Kevlin, David Bond, talks to Jimmy about a telescope he gave him. Kevlin says it's on Jimmy's roof. Carrying sticks, the Stompers show up outside the dance. The Stompers attack and a huge fight breaks out. Poochie gives a very late warning. The Diggers are winning the fight when Digger Wimpy, Don Devlin, pulls a knife and starts slashing. Tony! Tony's got a shiv, he slashed me! What's the matter, you Diggers too chicken to fight without shivs, huh? What are you doing? Finally, we're gonna kill me! No guns, no shit! Apparently, this is against the general rule of no guns or knives. Jimmy disarms Wimpy, and the police arrive. Both gangs start running. Brendo and Mangus stop the running Jimmy and offer him a ride. Brendo lets Jimmy drive to his apartment. Jimmy is impressed with the lavish lifestyle of the gangster. Brendo gives his side of the accident with Jimmy's father. Brendo says he will mentor Jimmy into the labor business. Brendo then gets a call that Pete and his friends held a private union meeting at the printing shop. Brendo drops Jimmy at home, and the meeting is still going on. Pete is upset that his son was in a fight, and the police came to his business to investigate. Kevlin tells Pete that Jimmy was not at fault. Later, Kevlin meets Jimmy on the roof, where the telescope is located. He says they have a new local and have rented an abandoned pier. The organizers believe the days of Brendo are numbered. Della arrives as Kevlin leaves. Jimmy is cranky that so many people are coming to his private place. Hi, Mr. Kevlin. Hello, Della. I thought Jimmy was up here alone. I'm just leaving, Della. Goodbye. Bye. Hi. How'd you know I was up here? Your ma told me. This place is getting to be like Grand Central Station. 
You said I could look for the telescope sometime. Go ahead. There aren't many things or people you like, are there? What are you talking about? Or else why do you always come up here to be alone? Listen, the only reason I got is my old man can't climb those stairs. Della invites Jimmy to church. They fight and then get all kissy-faced. The next day, the diggers watch the new union hiring from the rooftop. Wimpy shows up and now has a revolver. Kevlin offers some of the diggers jobs for the summer. A few diggers decide to work. Later, Jimmy forces the rest to go along, but just to watch. Bucci is left behind. Later, Brendo and his gang meet in reaction to the new union. He sends Mangus and a few guys to say there will be no reprisals if they walk off today. The ship's captain is not happy with the speed and quality of the work. The working diggers arrive for work while others watch from the sidelines. Mangus and two goons arrive to deliver the message. Mangus calls it a scab job and say they will not work again if they don't leave. A fight breaks out between Mangus's group and the union organizers. It ends as a solo fight between Mangus and Ferdinand Marschek, Joseph Vitale. Ferdinand wins the fight and Mangus is lowered off the ship in a cargo net. Jimmy and Chuck deliver the beaten Mangus back to Brendo. When Jimmy gets home, Pete gives him the business for helping Mangus. Jimmy says his father has started a fight in which people are going to get hurt or killed. Pete throws Jimmy out of the house. I hope you took good care of Frank Mangus. Do we have to fight about it? You asked for that, didn't you? Helping Brindos man. Can I ask you something? When do you figure I'm going to be able to have a few ideas of my own? You're my son. You will do and think what I want. Pa, I just can't keep fighting you like this. Every time we blow off at each other, I get sick. But you got no right to run me like you run that printing press. You helped Brindos man. Do you know why? Yes, I know why. You're licking his boots because you think some of that easy money will rub off on you. I helped Frank Mangus because this whole waterfront's going to start popping. Marchese and you started it. Somebody's going to get hurt real bad, Pop. I don't want it to be you because that mob would be the one to suffer. I tell you, you... Pa, you got to listen to me. People are beginning to think you've lost your mind. And that's what you think? Pa, will you listen to me for the love of Mike? Let's not fight again. Just listen to me. Listen to you, you Judas. You helped Frank Mangus. You helped Brindo's man. I only wanted to help you. Get out. Anne is broken by the fight between her husband and son. He's gone. He won't come back. You, you are to blame, Anna. He's your son. A woman's son. No more guts than a weak need woman. A decent woman, son, he would be. If you would let him. He was right. You can't break his back, so you are trying to break his spirit. Jimmy is living and working at a garage with Chuck. One day, Brendo comes in and gives Jimmy some money. Pucci is working on the telescope when Tony and two stompers climb onto the roof. Tony demands to see Jimmy. The stompers hang Pucci over the ledge for a bit. Tony says to tell Jimmy that they have to rumble tonight. When Jimmy finds out, he sends Chuck to round up the diggers. Jimmy doesn't know that Wimpy has a gun. The stompers arrive by truck. One of them clubs Poochie over the head. The fight breaks out in the street. Kevlin and Della carry Poochie away. Wimpy hides in a stairwell. Tony pulls a meat hook. He and Jimmy, who is armed with a club, begin to fight. Wimpy fires two shots, which breaks up the fight. The diggers get the gun from Wimpy and take his gang jacket away. Jimmy takes the gun to hide it. He hides the gun in an oil can in the garage and is chewed out by the owner of the garage for leaving it unattended. The police arrive and try to arrest Jimmy, but he escapes across the rooftop. When he is clear, he calls Brendo for help. Brendo encourages Jimmy to give himself up to the police. Jimmy arrives with a lawyer, Gotham, David Oreck. Gotham has the paperwork to get all the boys released. Since when are you taking kid cases? Since tonight, Captain. I suppose you have the habeas corpus writs all legal-like. Bonds are posted, too, if you're interested. I just lost interest. You know somebody could have been killed tonight? Nobody was. A cop asked Kevlin if the kids are worth trying to save. Sometime later, Della and Jimmy take a walk in the park. Della wants Poochie to go to summer camp but she needs Jimmy to convince him. They end up walking on the pier. They hear an ambulance and rush to find that Marashek has been killed in a hit and run accident. Pete can't believe that Marashek is dead. Anne looks on and knows that Pete has caused much of this trouble. She is still upset about Jimmy being kicked out of the house. 
Kevlin still thinks justice will catch up with Brendo. The DA has two teens who robbed Marichek's body before the ambulance arrived. They identify Lou Bassett, Benny Burke, a Brendo gang member, as the driver of the car. The DA orders Lou to be arrested. Brendo is worried that Lou will sing like a bird. Lawyer Gotham says they need a witness to testify that Lou wasn't in the car. We need somebody the jury will believe. But don't you know one honest looking person? Someone who lives right in the neighborhood? Well, in Park Avenue, you know. Kids are their witnesses. We could break them with an older and a brighter kid. That I can deliver. Well, he's got to be out of diapers. No right from wrong. This one fills the bill extra good. Pete Smigelski's son. Can you beat that for a reliable witness? Rindo takes Jimmy back to his apartment. Gotham finds out that the boys robbed the dead body and that Jimmy wants to help Brendo. They have Jimmy stay at Brendo's apartment. In court, Gotham impeaches the young boys for making a deal with the DA. Jimmy is called to the stand. Jimmy flat out lies on the stand saying he was alone and saw the car that hit Marshak. Jimmy says the driver was not Lou. The DA calls for an adjournment until the morning. Brendo has a big party, but Jimmy is sullen. A looking kid like him shouldn't need lessons. Hey, that's all right. <laughs> you know much about dancing? You complaining? <laughs> How old are you? 18 almost. Just right. When the doorbell rings, Mangus hides Jimmy in a back room. Jimmy's parents, Pete and Ann, are at the door. Jimmy comes out to talk to his folks. Pete calls his son a liar and says he has no son. After they leave, Jimmy is disgusted with himself. Jimmy is sitting in his room smoking. Poochie arrives at the window via the fire escape. He tells Jimmy that Della is sick and needs him. They leave together. On the street, a group of diggers grab Jimmy and throw him in a car. Wimpy, who is no longer in the gang, sees him take Jimmy into the garage. Della is waiting inside. She says she will tell that Jimmy is lying if he does not go into court and tell the truth. Jimmy, if you don't tell the truth, I'm going to go to court and I'm going to testify that you were with me the night Marchese was killed. And that you lied. When Brendo finds out that Jimmy is missing, lawyer Gotham says they have to get rid of Jimmy. At the garage, they leave Chuck with Jimmy and the rest go to get Kevlin. Wimpy calls Brando and tells him where Jimmy is located. Chuck has to go out on a run and Jimmy is left alone. Jimmy goes to a parked car in the garage to listen to the radio. Chuck is waiting outside and sees Brendo and Mangus pull into the garage. Chuck runs for help. Brendo and Mangus begin searching the garage for Jimmy. Chuck tells Pete that Brendo is gonna kill Jimmy. Pete heads out to the garage and Chuck calls for help. Jimmy slips out of the car and retrieves Wimpy's gun from the oil can. Brendo begins firing at Jimmy. Pete slips inside and beats Mangus to the ground with his cane. Pa, get out of here! Brendo shoots Pete. Jimmy shoots Brendo. Police sirens are heard coming and Jimmy thanks his wounded father. Much later, Jimmy is on the roof watching the new union hiring. Della comes by with a letter from Poochie, who is at camp. They get all kissy-faced, and Pete, who has a cast on his arm, calls for Jimmy to come make money. Jimmy says he wants to make time. Jimmy is now working in the printing shop, and in the fall, he will start college to be an engineer. Conclusion. When this film was released, the title had an asterisk for an explanation on many ads because Rumble was not widely known as a term for a gang fight at the time. Although he had 20 total credits, this was the only feature film for Barry Frondner who played Poochie. In the film, Jimmy, James Darren, says he is 17 years old. He was 20 years old at the time. Edgar Barry, who played Jimmy's father Pete, was 49. Celia Lovsky, who played Jimmy's mother, Anne was nearly 60. They used hair and makeup to age Edgar rather than try and make Celia look young. I told you there were some Star Trek connections in the introduction. 
Lovsky played T. Powell, the leader of the planet Vulcan, in the 1966 Season 2, Episode 1, A Mock Time of Star Trek 1966-69. to In that episode, Spock, Leonard Nimoy, goes into heat and has to fight Kirk, William Shatner, to the death. Lovsky is one of less than a dozen actors born in the 19th century who appeared in the 25th century series. Many years later, James Darren appeared on eight episodes in the 1993 season of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, 1998 to 1999. Whew, I almost messed up. I almost left out the most important Star Trek connection. James Darren was on T.J. Hooker, and T.J. Hooker is none other than Canadian actor William Shatner, the original Captain Kirk from Star Trek. Glad I remembered and put this in. I mentioned before that this was James Darren's first film. I also mentioned that musical performers in the film, Freddie Bell and his bellboys, mostly played on the Las Vegas Strip. I guess you are familiar with who ran that place back in the day. IMDB.com states that Darren is the godfather of Nancy Sinatra's daughter and granddaughter of Frank Sinatra. It makes me wonder if someone <laughs> did a horse head for Darren. Food for thought. World famous short summary? A girlfriend and a job will keep you off the streets. Or the docks. Beware the moors. I want to shout out to the super supporters. Rambling RJ, Thunderstruck54, Robert H, Jeffrey J, and all the others that have written in and commented. It's really appreciated. Thank you very much.